Coming in at number 10 is Calendar Man. Julian Gregory Day, whose name is a pun on the Julian and Gregorian calendars, has an obsession with dates, committing crimes that always have a relationship to the date that they are committed on, usually covering the major holidays. Like most of the messed up members of the Batman's rogue gallery, Calendar Man had a rough childhood. His parents neglected him, which almost resulted in his death from days of exposure, which in turn resulted in his complete psychotic break and obsession with days and holidays. First appearing in Detective Comics number 259 in September of 1958, Calendar Man was a bit sillier, using different costumes to commit crimes based on the days of the calendar, like dressing up as an Indian magician representing the monsoon season. But after the crisis on Infinite Earths, Calendar Man was barely used and instead got a great revamp by writer Jeff Lowe, Batman The Long Halloween. In this new version, Calendar Man was institutionalized in Arkham Asylum and was deemed as an insane, ruthless criminal with abbreviations of the months tattooed around his head in a circle with no silly costumes or ridiculous crimes. Number 9. Flamingo Eduardo Flamingo, known as Flamingo, is a world famous serial taker of lives and assassin. He is well known for a specific thing he does which inspired his sometimes name of the Eater of Faces. Which explains itself, I'd say. Eduardo was actually a morally strong advocate and fighter against organized crime, but it changed when he was captured and underwent forced brain surgery that altered his personality, making him dangerously psychotic. Now, the incredibly colorful flamingo is an enforcer and assassin, rocking a very unique look and somehow totally making a pink motorcycle not look silly. He has a dark, unfeeling personality and is an expert marksman, which makes up for his lack of powers and makes him a pretty dangerous threat for Batman. He has even temporarily paralyzed Damian Wayne. So think twice before you judge. He'll chew your face off, man. Batman's obscure villains usually happen to be a bit more serious and psychotic, but a lot of obscure villains can be completely ridiculous and silly. Which makes me wonder, what are some of the silliest and wackiest commonly unknown villains that you guys love? Let me know in the comments and I'll get on with this video. Number 8. Humpty Dumpty. With his house being demolished, his dog being run over, and his parents being crushed by a Christmas tree on Christmas, things weren't too great for Humphrey Dumpler. He was mistreated by his grandmother who he was forced to live with and because of his appearance and mental capacity, he was bullied. Of all things, the last straw for Humphrey was missing a subway train. Humphrey was obsessed with fixing things and since the missing of the train, he started going out late at night to disassemble and reassemble mechanical devices which had upset him in some way. But since he wasn't very intelligent and all the info he got was from books, the things he fixed actually caused a lot of accidents. The first was the same train he missed which then crashed. Now going by Humpty Dumpty, he was tracked down by Batgirl who dislocated her shoulder saving him. Humpty Dumpty fixed her shoulder but then also revealed that he had evolved from disassembling devices to disassembling and reassembling people. Namely his grandmother who he believed had to have been broken and in need of repair. So he took her apart, then attempted to sew her back together again with boot laces. Wow, that got really dark, like really quick. Kind of uncomfy. At number seven is Typeface. This guy really confuses me because although his name is ridiculous and he doesn't actually have any powers at all, he still shows up a decent amount in various comics. First appearing in the year 2000, Gordon Thomas is radicalized after he returns from the Vietnam War and his wife immediately leaves him, taking their child with her. He then becomes a sign maker and goes off to be a criminal with letters drawn on his face. And he actually defeats Spider-Man during their first encounter by throwing letters at him, which doesn't make any sense to me, honestly. But what's even weirder is that he returns as a good guy during the Civil War Frontline storyline and fights alongside some pretty well-respected heroes like Battlestar and Solo before he's ultimately killed by Venom while facing off against the Secret Avengers. Number 6. Cornelius Sturk Cornelius Sturk is one of those villains that you don't hear much about, but is one of the more gruesome and terrifying members of Batman's rogue gallery. Sturk suffers from delusions which make him believe that he requires the nutrients of a human heart in order to stay alive, and not just any heart. Specifically, Cornelius believes that the heart is the most nutritious when it is full of norepinephrine, a natural hormone that secretes when a person is terrified, as well as 
adrenaline. So he uses his unexplained psionic ability to mentally make people perceive him as someone else, which other than allowing him to break out of Arkham Asylum, also allowed him to get close to his victims and then completely terrify them in the most insane ways before he quickly ends them and partakes in a nice old hearty meal, literally. I think the interesting thing about Stirk is that he is actually really effective at what he does, being able to evade Batman and even render him unconscious on one occasion. Number five, the Frightful Four. Ah, a second group inspired by the Fantastic Four. Yes, the Frightful Four also did not come up with a very clever name. The Wizard, the Sandman, and Pastepot Pete, who all regularly did battle with the Human Torch and were defeated by him around the same time, realized that they all had unique powers and a mutual disdain for the Fantastic Four. The Wizard suggested that they form a group that would be the evil counterparts to the Fantastic Four. A great idea, but it's just three dudes. They need a fourth member to their group, and what do you know, the wizard had heard of a strange woman hiding out on a remote island on the Mediterranean who had complete control of her hair. Traveling there, the wizard convinced Madame Medusa to join their ranks. Now this Madame Medusa was actually Medusa of the Inhumans as some of you may have guessed, but she was kept under the influence of the wizard using a device that kept her memories forgotten to her. They made their first attack at Mr. Fantastic and Invisible Woman's engagement party, which is kind of just rude if you ask me. Number 4, Colonel Sulphur. This Denny O'Neill created villain from the 70s is an espionage expert with a weaponized artificial hand, a tool he has used to commit very espionage type crimes. He's very Bond villainy if we're being honest. Colonel Sulphur has a strange sunlight fixation though, meaning he only allows himself to act on his violent urges in the quote, morning's earliest minutes, which is one hell of a specific yet very obscure time frame for criminal activity. He did actually prove to be a bit more of a threat when he joined the Army of Crime. When the Army of Crime's activities were challenged by Batman and Superman, Sulphur used an alien weapon to trap Superman and Batman in a timeless dimension. Sulphur then used stolen weapons to take over Gotham City, but as you may suspect, he was soon stopped by Batman and Superman, who had escaped from the timeless dimension. These things happen. Sorry, dude. At number three, we have Big Wheel. Originally taken on by Jackson Wheel, the mantle of Big Wheel is started when he owes money to Rocket Racer, who continues to hound him for payment. So he decides to have an enormous, extremely durable wheel crafted, which is outfitted with machine guns and can be commandeered by a driver. But but his first big attack on Rocket Racer goes wrong and Spider-Man just kind of watches it all go down. Basically, it ends in Big Wheel careening into the Hudson River. But he survives because the wheel is airtight, so he had that covered. Later, Big Wheel reforms himself and even teams up with Spider-Man at one point. Honestly, he's actually somewhere between obscure and quite prevalent depending on how you look at his legacy because even though he seldom ever appeared in the Spider-Man comics, he has gone down as one of the most enjoyed obscure villains among Spider-Man. Man fans. Number two, the Condiment King. I think at this point, Condiment King is a little more well known just because of how ridiculous he is. He first appeared in the DC animated universe as Buddy Standler, who was a comedian manipulated by the Joker into being a Batman villain. He became an even bigger joke of a character when he was introduced to the DC comics as Mitchell Mayo. No, I am not joking. Yes, that is his actual name. No one really takes Condiment King that seriously, and I can understand why. Although it should be noted that he can totally stain your clothes, and if you're allergic to any of the condiments he fires out of his ketchup, barbecue sauce, and mustard guns, then he can be quite dangerous. What I'm most curious of is the quality of his short-lived restaurant when he temporarily went legit. Could you imagine if he couldn't even get food right? That would just suck. Number one, Johnny Karaoke. I actually couldn't find a page for Johnny Karaoke on the DC Wiki, so that should tell you just how obscure this guy actually is. Johnny Karaoke is a Yakuza loan shark who has the odd knack of singing into his microphone as he is committing his crimes. A microphone whose stand doubles as a sword that he will pull out on you when you let your guard down from laughing at him. On top of his odd singing career, Johnny leads a little gang known as the Geisha Girls that spell G R R L S, like grrrls. 
very, very fear inspiring. Maybe not the most intimidating of Batman's villains, not at all really, but this villain is honestly just too interesting to stay buried for too long. I'm personally advocating for the big screen debut of Johnny Karaoke, and it better be comic book accurate. Number 10, the S-Men. Red Skull being the dastardly devil he is, made some backup plans in the case of his eventual demise. One such plan was a clone of himself who would come back in the modern era. Okay, side note, why do villains do this, making clones of themselves? The individual villain still kind of passes away, so if they move their consciousness or something, that kind of makes sense, but I don't get why this is a thing. But I'm pretty sure this clone isn't even like that. I'm gonna make myself upset, so let's just continue. Basically, waking up in this new modern world with mutants and all that jazz, this new Red Skull decided that he was going to dig up the body of Professor X and steal some of his brain granting himself some telepathy, and as an antithesis to the X-Men, he created the S-Men. Ah, yes, very creative. This was a group of individuals that the Red Skull had empowered using crazy mad science and magic. Almost all of them were pretty quickly taken out of existence by Magneto when this Red Skull tried to make a camp to exterminate mutants. Bad move, buddy. Bad move. Number nine, Zodiac Cartel. Honestly, it's a pretty cool idea for a group. This villainous group of hand-picked business leaders who were all born under different zodiac signs as their leader Cornelius Van Lunt, or Taurus, was heavily into astrology. Each member, while representing a zodiac sign, also was based in a different American city, and their main goal was world economic and political domination. Its members originally were, other than Cornelius, Scorpio, Jake Fury, Aquarius, Darren Bentley, Aries, Marcus Lassiter, Cancer, Jack Cleveno, Capricorn, Willard Weir, Gemini, Joshua Link, Leo, Daniel Radford, Libra, Gustav Brandt, Pisces, Noah Perricone, Sagittarius, Harlan Vargas, and my representative, Virgo, Elaine McLaughlin. The team was first formed after the dissolution of a previous group called the Great Wheel of Zodiac, which had covert agents from around the globe, including Baron Von Strucker, Dum Dum Dugan, and even Leonardo da Vinci. Its dissolution also led to the creation of S.H.I.E.L.D., Hydra, and Leviathan as well. So you could definitely say it was important and somehow still relatively obscure. Number eight, Headman. Sometimes it takes the smallest of things to bring people together. And while that may sound like an extremely beautiful sentiment, I'm saying it in relation to the villainous team known as the Headmen, who it seems came together because each of their powers revolves around their heads in one way or another. And it's honestly kind of unsettling in my opinion. Bonded together through their heads, these scientists sought out world domination, bringing them into conflict with the Defenders, She-Hulk, and Spider-Man. This quartet consisted of Arthur Nagin, their leader, who had his head transplanted onto the body of a gorilla, Ruby Thursday, who replaced her own head with an organic computer capable of changing shape, Gerald Morgan, aka Shrunken Bones, accidentally shrank his own skeleton, including his skull, so he basically has really baggy skin, and Chandu, the mystic's head, has been transplanted by Nagin onto a number of different bodies throughout his time, making him quite versatile. Number seven, Joker's daughter. Honestly, did not even know this character existed, which just shows how much I don't know about Batman's villains. Duella Dent is all over the place. Psychologically, I mean. She started as the villain who refers to herself as Joker's daughter, even though she is absolutely not his daughter. As you can tell, she has an unhealthy obsession with the clown, which has been a thing since she debuted in Batman Family Number no. 6 in 1976. She has also claimed to be the daughter of Catwoman, Scarecrow, Riddler, and Penguin. She deduced Robin's identity, and he in turn revealed that she was Duella Dent, and that it was believed that she was actually Two-Face's daughter. Which also isn't true, as she is actually from Earth-3, and her father was Jokester, with her mother being Evelyn Dent, Earth-3's Three-Face. Despite not being Joker's child, Duella proves herself worthy of the title. She uses equipment that is very similar to the Joker's usual flair, and more recently, she has been rewritten as almost completely bonkers, which is especially evident after the Clown Prince's seeming demise. Also, before 2011, she was on the Teen Titans as Harlequin for a while. Number six, the UFOs. Ah, these villains and their cleverly chosen team names. UFOs, like UFOs, because they got their powers in space. Yes, of course. Someone get me out of here, please. 
Okay, the UFOs here, inspired by the powers gained by the Fantastic Four, went to great lengths trying to reproduce the same accident that gave those heroes their abilities. The attempt succeeded, but they were interrupted by Bruce Banner, who discovered their ground control facility and was able to bring the shuttle down, because he thought it had been exposed to the cosmic radiation by accident. They were none too happy, as they thought they could have been made even stronger if he had not interfered, and they displayed their newfound powers in a frankly pretty awesome fight with the Incredible Hulk even if they lost. Vapor has the ability to alter her form into any known gas. Vector gained the power of telekinesis from cosmic rays. X-Ray has been permanently transformed into a living energy field with the power to expel forms of heavy radiation capable of hurting even the Hulk. Ironclad has been permanently transformed into organic metal steel. He has superhuman strength, durability, and the ability to decrease or increase his own weight. His fight with the Hulk literally shook the universe, which is super cool. You should probably check him out. At number five, we have Frank Oliver, AKA Kangaroo. This guy's power is basically artificially enhanced legs. And aside from that, he's just known to be a very skilled boxer who is banned from the sport after seriously injuring one of his opponents. But the way that he gets this sort of lame jumping power is when Jonas Harrow approaches him and offers him the powers in exchange for his cooperation in a highly dangerous height. While he's infiltrating the Hudson Nuclear Laboratories to steal some radioactive something or other, Spider Man swoops in to try and stop him. Well, not stop him, but to save his life because the room he's breaking into is so radioactive that it disintegrates him immediately upon entry. And Spider Man watches on in horror as this happens. The Kangaroo Mantle has a couple other appearances, but as far as I'm concerned, this event marks the end for the villain and leaves him behind in the void of obscurity. Number four, Wrecking Crew. When when Dirk Garthwaite, otherwise known as Wrecker, held onto his enchanted crowbar, he invited his three chums, ex-physicist Dr. Elliot Franklin, ex-army master sergeant Henry Camp, and ex-farmhand Brian Kaluski to come and do the same in the middle of a thunderstorm. When lightning struck the crowbar, all three men were empowered, becoming Thunderball, Bulldozer, and Piledriver respectively, and coming together to be the villainous wrecking crew. These mystical strongmen were mainly an enemy to Thor, but they originally fought against the Defenders. This group has actually been around for a pretty long time and have battled many a superhero. The Fantastic Four, Avengers, Omega Flight, Spider-Man, the Thunderbolts, and even got into a fight between the Marvel and DC universes. Number 3, Lord Deathman. The Japanese crime boss known as Lord Deathman has battled Batman both in American comics and in Japanese manga using his powers to seemingly overcome death itself, able to rise from the grave no matter what his injury is. In his first First appearance in Batman number 180 in May 1966, he passed away three times using a yogi technique to appear dead before the final conflict which saw him get struck by lightning and actually pass away. But since then, he has actually gained the real power to come back from the dead, but at the cost of having a bare bone skull for a head. His regenerative abilities are so powerful that his blood is used to create the infamous Lazarus pits that Ra's al Ghul uses to stay young and immortal. One of the first ways Batman defeated Lord Death with his new powers is honestly a little out of character for the Crusader. He threw Lord Deathman off a building into the path of an armored car, which took the criminal down just long enough for Catwoman to lock him in a safe, and then he was shot into space. And he still came back. Number 2, Death Throws. Remember how the headmen all came together based on their head related powers? Well, I'll do you one better. How about the Death Throws, whose powers and names all have something to do with commonly throwing stuff? The leader, ringleader, threw together teammates Bombshell, Knickknack, Oddball, Tenpin, and Throwdown into a group that works really well together, juggling their weapons between each other and doing battle with characters like Captain America, Crossfire, Hawkeye, and even Loki of all people who stopped the group from robbing the big top casino in Las Vegas. The Marvel Wiki even lists their origins as quote unquote, joint effort to perform criminal and mercenary acts while using juggling expertise. I honestly kind of had a hoot putting together this point, as I can't believe this group of villains even exists. And lastly at number one is Horticulture. Okay, of all the teams on this list, I think the Horticulture are my favorite. 
For starters, they look so cool. But then, you find out it's a bunch of older women between the ages of 64 to 81 who are all expert botanists and want to bring Earth back to its more pristine time when it had about 7 billion less people on it. I just love how they use their regular names and the names just kind of suit their age and interest in plants. I don't know how, but they kind of just do. Augusta Bromes, Lily Lamus, Edith Scutch, and Opal Vetiver. Gosh. But yes, that's right, these ladies want to basically exterminate most of the Earth's human population and bring plants back to the forefront, specifically flowers. This goal brings them into conflict with the X-Men in 2019's X-Men number 3. Beyond biological modifications believed to have been made to themselves, the women of horticulture are experts at manipulating the environment to suit their extinction agenda. And they're also computer programmers, selling software to Orcus to monitor Krakoan gateways. But seriously, look at them. They're just awesome. At number 10, we have Mindworm. First introduced in 1974's Amazing Spider-Man number 138, Mindworm is a mutant who has the ability to absorb the psionic energy from his targets and sap their energy, and absorb that energy for himself. The first time he uses this power is on his own mother, who he accidentally kills by draining all of her energy in one go. This traumatic event drives his father into shock, causing him to run into traffic killing him as well. Mindworm has a tough life in and out of orphanages and homeless shelters and eventually has a run-in with Peter Parker while he's living in a neighboring apartment. But when Parker notices Mindworm's attempts at draining his psionic energy, he knocks out the villain who is then taken to prison. Soon after this, Mindworm reforms and becomes good, but is killed by a street gang after having never actually killed anyone using his powers other than his own mother. Honestly, it's a really sad story and I don't know why they had to do him that bad, but that's Mindworm. Uh, pretty obscure. At number nine is Spider Side. First introduced as Spider Man in the Clone Saga, Spider Side appears as a super jacked, massive version of Spider Man that has Ben Riley and Peter Parker wondering even more who the real Spider Man is. But soon, this third Spider-Man soon goes mad and becomes Spider-Side, attacking the other heroes in a raving frenzy. He seems to be capable of some pretty nifty shape-shifting, as though he has some kind of symbiotic physiology, but ultimately he's left in the annals of the 90s and not really revisited again after the Clone Saga. My best guess is that he was just too OP and or confusing as a character. At number 8 is The Living Brain. This is one of the oldest Spider-Man villains in general, and especially on this list, and one that very few people ever reference these days. First introduced in 1964's The Amazing Spider-Man number 8, the living brain is a supercomputer that continually gets hacked by villains to attack Spider-Man and the people of New York City. Basically, this is what the height of AI looked like back in the 60s, making this villain not just obscure in the world of Spider-Man comics, but in the real world as well, as we are now in 2022. He looks like a dishwasher with arms, if we're being honest. But he sort of makes his rounds a little more than one might expect such a silly villain to. So I held him back on the list a little bit. Number seven, Circus of Crime. Fritz Tibbalt, then manager and ringmaster of a small Austrian circus, became active in the Axis powers during World War II. He was asked by German intelligence to take his circus to the United States of America to give performances in major cities while actually using his circus members' powers and talents in order to take out government officials. Fritz Tibbalt's evil circus of crime consisted of Omir the Snake Charmer, Tommy Thumb, the Trapeze Trio, and Zandau the Strongman. However, Tibbalt, who came to be known as the Ringmaster of Death, was captured by Captain America. But fast forward and the Circus of Crime's new MO was giving a performance to a large audience, then the ringmaster would use the powerful mind control device in his hat to put the audience into a trance. The circus members then robbed the audience who would remember nothing about the thefts when the ringmaster released them from the trance, and the performance continued. 
This criminal circus fought the Hulk, Spider-Man, the Hawkeyes, the Avengers, and others. At number six is the Ringer. This is one of those characters that we can basically assume was named before his powers were decided, because ultimately it's a pretty ridiculous power and suit design, especially in the early days. He basically just shoots rings at his enemies, which can do anything between entrapping the target to exploding on impact to freezing. The first time we really encounter the Ringer, he's taken out pretty quickly by not Spider-Man, but Nighthawk, losing some teeth in the battle and spending a lot of time in jail. He's then eventually killed by Scourge when he's called to a bar with a group of other villains, which ends up being a trap. Later, however, it's revealed that he doesn't actually die and is revived by AIM agents who give him a cyborg body and he's renamed Strike Back. With a big enough power boost and a totally different mantle to make him a whole different character from the Ringer, the Ringer is essentially lost to obscurity, making him one of the most long lost Spider-Man villains of all time. Number five, Maxi Zeus. I had a really cool history professor in high school who specifically taught classics, which is Greek and Roman history. Super cool guy, but I'm just imagining him becoming a Gotham crime lord. He was an awesome person, so I just can't see it. But luckily in DC Comics, we have Maxi Zeus, a former history teacher. Following the loss of his wife, Maxi Zeus started to suffer from delusions that he was the actual human reincarnation of the god Zeus. Using his genius level intellect, he became a Gotham City crime lord, establishing himself and his group of followers. I mean cultists. I mean mobsters. I don't really know. He had a short-lived battle against Batman and he has been pretty much locked up at Arkham ever since, occasionally breaking out. Most recently though, his randomly super strong and ripped body was used to revive Deacon Blackfire. But this didn't last very long, so it doesn't really matter. At number four is Walrus, another very strange villain based on an animal that seems to have been picked out of a hat. This New York City carpenter's journey in petty crime starts when his uncle gives him powers that marginally increase his strength, speed, and stamina. He takes on the mantle of Walrus and is first shown battling the Defenders in issue 131 in 1984. But he's taken out by a good guy version of Frogman who at the time is understandably a less respected member of the Defenders. So it really hits home that Walrus is not to be taken seriously. And it also suggests that he was probably never meant to last very long in the first place. Years later, there is an interesting run in with Deadpool where Walrus gains quite a power boost and actually almost kills Deadpool. But all things considered, he is largely known to be lost to obscurity like the rest on this list. Number three, Menagerie. The Menagerie is likely a more recent evil team, showing up for the first time in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3, number 1, in April of 2014, when they tried to steal valuable decorated eggs from an antique store and were pretty easily defeated. So like, from the get go, the impressive feats are on the lower side of the list, if you know what I'm saying. In fact, I'd say the most famous thing they've done is when they disintegrated Spider-Man's spider suit, making him have to create web underwear for himself. And it's kind of the underwear that is remembered here, not the menagerie. The animal themed criminal team was created by White Rabbit, and its members included Hippo, Ox, Skine, who did the spider suit disintegrating, Squid, Swarm, and wait for it, Panda Mania. Nice. The Menagerie also is known for trying to rob a club where Nadia Van Dyne was celebrating her birthday with numerous other heroes, which, as you can imagine, it didn't go too well for them. Okay, coming in at number two is Hypno Hustler. This guy is first introduced in 1978 and has a pretty short shelf life. Like, one issue short. Maybe with a couple more later on, but that's his main introduction. That's the only time we really see him. His powers are basically that he can hypnotize audiences at his shows using his hypnotic guitar. Playing alongside his band, The Mercy Killers, Hypno Hustler is first caught taking money and valuables from others in the audience at what appears to be their own will. But alas, it is hypnosis. He's also got these hypno boots that emit knockout gas and have retractable knives built into them as well. It's fair to say that this villain doesn't last very long and is sort of left in the dust after this first encounter with Spider-Man. Later, Hypno Hustler has a brief stint with Villain On, which is Villains Anonymous, where he tries to reform alongside the likes of Armadillo and Big Wheel himself. 
that's basically it. At number one is Video Man. This guy's a double whammy because he is himself a rather obscure villain, all things considered. But also the technology that this character was designed in reference to is also obscure in itself, so I felt I had to put him at number one on the list. In fact, Video Man was abandoned so quickly by writers that his origin story is never even revealed. First appearing in the first issue of 2006's Spider-Man Family featuring Amazing Friends, he is quickly taken out after his first encounter and reduced to a little processor unit, which Spider-Man says he keeps in his freezer until, I guess, the present day, so as not to reawaken Video Man. What strikes me as strange about Video Man is that he was conceptualized in 2006, but his style is clearly referential to video games or maybe TV from the 80s or 90s, so just a total miss all around. And we're yet to see him again after his first fateful encounter in 2006.